welcome to this very important lecture on corrosion here we will look back at a theme which we have already introduced in some previous lecture uh, which is the port bear diagram this is very important it is what we attempt to do in this lecture is to elaborate pore bay diagram in the context of corrosion. Let us step back and look at pore bay diagram in a more general context. It is when you get into a new topic, it's good to understand this new topic from the point of what you have understood in the past. In this context, it is useful to look at this lecture called Facebook Introduction. This is in the playlist on undergraduate macroscopic thermodynamics. In this lecture, what we did was introduce concepts of symmetry to understand structure of phases, solids, liquids, and gases. On basis of symmetry, we classified the solids to have discrete translation uh, symmetry, whereas fluids have continuous translation symmetry. So this is important consequence in terms of properties of the different phases and also the nature of the phase diagram. So what is a phase diagram? So what in a phase diagram, what we attempt to do is that as a function of typical variables, in this case, macroscopic variables, which can be controlled. So here, the y-axis is the pressure and volume is the x-axis. As a function of these two variables, we ask the question, how in which phase um, the material will be present, whether will it be present as a solid, liquid, or a gas, or a two-phase system. These kinds of questions um, were answered uh, via this lecture. So using these concepts, it is good to understand uh, what we are trying to do in terms of electrochemical phase diagrams. So, Pore bay diagram is an electrochemical phase diagram. We have looked at the pore bay diagram in a previous uh, lecture. This is the lecture uh, in the same uh, playlist. So what is that we attempt to do? In the previous slide, we discussed the phase diagram using two variables, pressure and volume. As opposed to that, in the context of electrochemistry, the two knobs or two variables which we can control easily is the electrochemical potential and the pH. So by varying the electrochemical potential and the pH, what we are doing is that we are varying the energy of the electron. This axis is indicative of the energy of the electron. We'll look at this in the next few slides. And this axis is indicative of the energy of the proton. So via the hydronium ion, okay, uh, we introduce oxygen. And as a function of these two energies and these two variables, that is the potential of the electrode and the pH of the electrolyte, we ask, what is the form of copper in this case? That is the phase diagram, which is the pore bay diagram of copper uh, is being considered here, considered here. So in which form copper is present? Is it present as copper solid zero valent form or the divalent copper two plus in the aqueous condition? This is when copper is corroded or in the form of different oxides or oxidized uh, copper anions um, in the aqueous uh, solution. So this is what we attempt to do in the pore bay diagram. So please look at this lecture to understand pore bay diagrams better. 
So we will look at pore bear diagram in the context of corrosion. So we will look at a particular pore bear diagram, that of nickel. This may appear complex because a lot of information is presented in a single diagram. But if you have looked at a variety of phase diagram, let's say a simple water phase diagram or in the context of material science, iron carbon phase diagram, you may anticipate that the phase diagram will contain lots of information because the structure of materials under different condition is very different. Um, here too, we are attempting to describe uh, such kind of information. So let's go through this slowly and gradually to understand the information presented. So let's first look at a particular line. Okay, so we this number refers to a particular line. And a particular line indicates uh, equilibrium between two different phases. Okay, so um, here nickel and water is present on one side and nickel hydroxide is present on the other side. So how can nickel can get converted to this by reacting with water? It can get converted to nickel hydroxide and two protons and two electrons. So this line indicates the equilibrium between this reactants and these products. So or these phases, it, it, the line this line indicates the equilibrium between these phases and these phases. So why, and then going further, as you increase the pH, that is as the pH value increases, you get to more and more basic conditions. Therefore, a proton is being stabilized as you go in this direction. And electrodes, electron is present in the electrode and as you go in the anodic direction, electron is getting stabilized. So the question we ask is that as you change the pH, so which is indicative of proton stability, as you change the potential, which is indicative of electron stability, which side of the equilibrium will dominate? So if I go to more and more basic conditions because the proton is getting stabilized as we go towards most basic condition. So the equilibrium will be shifted from this side to this side. Likewise, when I go to more and more anodic conditions, electron is getting stabilized. That is the free energy of the electron given by uh, this typical formula which you have seen in your high school, delta G is equal to minus NFE, in this case um, FE. Um, the, because of that kind of reasoning, as you go towards the anodic region, electron is getting stabilized. So when the electron free energy is getting stabilized, the equilibrium will shift from this side to this side. So how do we interpret this? So you can ask two kinds of question. You can ask a question by keeping a potential constant as you change the pH, what gets transformed into what? So for example, let's consider that the electrode potential is kept a constant, that is it is at negative 0.5. As you go from an acidic pH to the basic pH. We just said that the proton is getting stabilized. Therefore, this side gets favored. Therefore, nickel gets transformed into nickel hydroxide. Nickel gets transformed into nickel hydroxide as the pH goes from acidic region to the basic region. So that kind of information can be seen from the pore bay diagram. On, on the other hand, you can also keep the pH a constant and 
ask the question, what happens when the potential gets modified? So supposing we keep the pH as 10, um, you're not varying the energy of proton. Um, you are just increasing the, I mean, the potential going from cathodic potentials to anodic potential because we, when we do this, um, the electron gets stabilized. Therefore, the equilibrium gets shifted from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Therefore, nickel gets converted to nickel hydroxide by reacting with water. So this idea of potential stabilizing electron has been explained in the first few lectures in this playlist. Um, to understand this statement, why proton gets stabilized from via the pH, you should look at your uh, chemical engineering thermodynamics or chemical um, thermodynamics textbook. So typically, let's say Vannes and Smith or certain uh, physical chemistry textbook will give you clarification, will clarify this idea of proton stability as a function of pH. This is some basic aspect of chemical thermodynamics. Moving further, uh, we discuss this reaction and this particular line. We can, again, look at a different line. Let's say line number three. This is this line that discusses equilibrium between these species and these species. Using the same argument which we gave in the previous slide, when I go to more basic pH, proton gets stabilized. Therefore, let's say when keep the potential a constant, let's say you can keep the potential, let's say to be at 0.2, keeping the potential constant when you go to more basic region, the equilibrium gets shifted from this side to this side. Therefore, nickel hydroxide would get converted to Ni3O4. Again, you can keep the pH a constant. Let's say you keep the pH to be 10 and just go to more anodic potential because electron gets stabilized. Therefore, the equilibrium gets shifted from this side to this side. That is the nickel hydroxide gets um, modified to uh, Ni3O4. So overall, this is a phase map which tells you the phase of nickel as you vary these two knobs, the knobs of pH and the knobs of potential. There are different other lines, but the logic is very similar to what we utilized in these two um, uh, equilibrium systems. So I'm not going to repeat it, but I'm going to take a qualitatively different line, line number seven. So where is line number seven? This is the line. Why is this qualitatively different? Let's first understand that. So in all these equilibrium, both protons and electrons were present. But as opposed to this, here we only have a proton. So when both protons and electrons were present, these lines were slanted. However, when an electron is absent, this line is a vertical line. A vertical line is indicative of the fact that this equilibrium is independent of electrode potential because electrode potential will couple only to the energy of an electron. When the electron is absent, this reaction equilibrium is independent of the free energy of the electron. So here, the only thing that can be modulated between these two knobs is that you can modulate the free energy of the proton by varying the pH. Right? Um, so what are we looking at? Let's say we are thinking about how to get nickel 2+, plus, which is a state where nickel has been corroded, 
to get it to a form of nickel hydroxide. Um, so to do that, if we go from acidic pH to basic pH, proton gets stabilized. You go from a region where Ni2 plus is most um, favorable species to this species. So supposing you keep uh, the potential uh, constant and go in this direction, you go from this region to this region. Because there are no electrons here, this electrode equilibrium, uh, 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 this equilibrium is independent of electrode potential. So even when you go from, let's say, this particular potential to this particular potential, uh, the chemical equilibrium is not affected by electrode potential. That's why this line is vertical. Again, you can have another line, line number eight. This particular equilibrium is unaffected by electrode potential because there are no electrons present in on either side of this chemical equilibrium. Again, when you go from this pH to this pH, proton gets stabilized. So the equilibrium gets modified from this re uh, region to this region where these two species are present. As opposed to these two classes of reactions, this class is different. Why so? Here, both protons and electrons were present. Here, only protons were present. Here, there are no protons, but only electrons. So let's first identify this particular uh, line. This particular line is here. This line is deals with the equilibrium between nickel and nickel 2 plus present the, in the aqueous state plus two electrons present in the electrode. So only um, um, energy that can be modified by changing pH or the potential is the energy of the electrons. When you go to anodic regions, the electron gets stabilized. Therefore, this gets stabilized. The equilibrium will shift from this side to this side. That is what happens here. So keep pH a constant, let's say pH 4. As you go from a cathodic potential to anodic potential, nickel gets transformed to Ni2 plus and two electrons in the electrode. This goes into the electrolyte. So here, to get to the thermodynamics, we are, I mean, when we um, specify the pore bay diagram, we typically assume the concentration of nickel 2 plus to be a certain uh, value, let's say 10 to the negative 6 molar, that is required for um, computing or specifying the free energy of Ni2 plus. The free energy of nickel, uh, you take this is a pure substance, you take the activity to be 1. With that, you can calculate the chemical potential of Ni. Once you know the concentration activity uh, of uh, nickel 2 plus, you can uh, activity coefficient of nickel 2 plus, you can get to the activity. From there, you can get to the free energy of Ni2 plus. All these things are part of chemical engineering thermodynamics or chemical thermodynamics. Please refer to your um, textbook to get to the exact formula that can be utilized for um, measuring, uh, for specifying the chemical thermodynamics. We have also looked at how to do all these things in the context of electrochemical thermodynamics in a previous set of lectures in the same playlist. So we will move on. The rest of the reactions um, are associated with different lines that are seen here. All these things contain both proton and electrons. The logic is very similar to this. We won't elaborate this, but you can go through this and understand um, the entire poor bay diagram of nickel, all uh, regimes uh, using the logic we have specified on how the energy of uh, proton and electron changes, which modifies uh, 
the chemical equilibrium. Okay, the chemical equilibrium can be shifted from the left hand side to the right hand side. All right. So, having understood the four bear diagram of nickel, we can look at the utility of four bear diagram in the context of corrosion. What is that we are interested in the context of corrosion? We are interested in regimes where nickel will be immune. Okay, for example, there are only two knobs we are specifying here. As a function of pH and the potential, in this regime, that is in this regime, nickel is immune to corrosion. Whereas in this regime, corresponding to nickel being present as Ni2 plus in the aqueous medium, nickel is susceptible to corrosion. Supposing you are in this potential, in this pH, Nickel 2 plus will be the dominant species, so nickel will get corroded. As opposed to this, in all these regions, in this region, nickel has been passivated, so there is no corrosion. But corresponding to this region, nickel again can get corroded. So this is the main utility of poor bear diagram in the context of corrosion, because Four bed diagram gives you thermodynamic indicators of the state of the material, whether it will be immune to corrosion or it will get corroded or get passivated. Um, we look at a specific uh, aspect, uh, which is we will also look at this when in a lecture, a future lecture on anodic protection. So typically, when you go from a cathodic potential to an anodic potential, as you uh, go to a, a anodic potential, typically you go from an immune region to a region where there is corrosion. This is what we mean by an active region. The current will increase. The corrosion current will increase. And once you go to sufficiently anodic potentials, you go into a, a passivating region. So we are not going to elaborate on the transpassive uh, region. This involves further details, which can be um, um, garnered from a book on corrosion. Uh, but what we are emphasizing is that as you go uh, from a cathodic potential to more and more anodic potential, first you may have a region where there is corrosion, but after a particular point, uh, you may get to a passivating region. So what are the limitations of Fourier diagram? Because this is based on thermodynamics, it has the typical limitations associated with thermodynamics. To compute the thermodynamics, we need to have information of the environment. The reaction conditions has to be well specified. So the accuracy of the Fourier diagram is dependent on the accuracy uh, by which you can specify the environment, the reaction conditions. Again, poor bear diagram is typically specified with a particular temperature and pressure. So it is only applicable at that temperature and pressure and that reactive uh, condition. So equilibrium might not be established in some cases. Um, when we talk about chemical equilibrium, we're typically thinking about a closed system. In some cases, let's say even when you form Ni2+, if that is continuously removed from the system, um, you may have an open system. So uh, these kinds of conditions is not typically uh, elaborated via a poor bay diagram. But even in those conditions, uh, the four bear diagram gives a very good idea of what might be happening. Um, again, four bear diagram is based on thermodynamics, so there can be no information on rates. We are not really uh, specifying anything about the rate of formation of the oxide layer or the uh, hydroxide layer. So we really do not know how thick or what are the rates of formation of the hydroxide or the oxide layer. So there's no information on, on rates. Even with these limitations, uh, poor bear diagram is very useful. We will shift gears in the next uh, 
lecture and go from thermodynamics to some rate information. And again, this is going to give you an important aspect of uh, corrosion, um, especially in terms of uh, um, defining what we mean by corrosion potential. And we will reconnect with a topic which we have looked at in some previous lecture, Tafel slope and see how it is going to be useful in the context of corrosion. We will look at these topics in the next lecture. Thank you.